Welcome to the 75th episode of Delega, a podcast between two friends about the latest in politics, society, and feminism in Indonesia and the world. I'm Stephanie Tangkilisan. And I'm Sidi and Lee. And this week... Uh, we're going to cover some breaking news about the riots that broke out in Bosurabaya and Manokwari over the weekend regarding tensions and clashes with West Papuans. West Papuan students in particular and West Papuan people versus parts of the Indonesian bureaucracy in the military. Well, this is an ongoing story. We want to take this opportunity to talk about the history behind this conflict and all the things that led West Papuans to think that they are not truly part of Indonesia and considered as equal citizens. Mm -hmm. Listeners, obviously, this is an ongoing news story, so things will change. We're recording this on Monday, August 19th. And both Stephanie and I are not experts, we're not West Papuans, uh, but we still feel that this is an important moment to talk about historic tensions and... We also want to take this time to discuss what we can do and how we can confront our own racial prejudices and appropriation of West Papuan culture and really just think about what can be done or what should be done in the future. So, here's to a difficult but important conversation. Police say they have regained control of the situation in West Papua province after protesters torched a local town hall and set fire to tires. They were protesting the recent detention of 43 Papuan students who had been accused of throwing an Indonesian flag into a sewer. Chani Vatvani tells us more. So these are kind of the more undisputed facts of what happened. Indonesian authorities raided a university dorm in Surabaya and arrested dozens of West Papuan students over a standoff about the Indonesian flag that was simply thrown into a sewer. Mm -hmm. And um, officers broke down the gates of this building and used tear gas to clear the rooms and taking 43 people into custody. And this was particularly uh, significant because, as, as listeners, as you know, this past weekend was Independence Day weekend. So everybody was all caught up in emotion over this news that somebody, some group of people have basically, quote unquote, desecrated and destroyed the Indonesian flag. Right. So another thing to note, um, if you don't know, is that in Indonesia, desecrating the flag, you know, either by stepping on it or burning it or any sorts of thing is against the law mm -hmm. and is punishable by the Indonesian courts. Um, you know, you can think what you want about whether or not this is a just law to be put in place, mm -hmm. but that's definitely a part of this kind of like justification the Indonesian police had over raiding the dormitory. Mm -hmm. And I think what a lot of authorities have started to discover is that the misinformation first started amongst WhatsApp groups, in particular WhatsApp groups amongst, I think, more extremist or more radical groups, uh, really disseminating information about anyone who's doing anything to threaten NKRI or this idea of Indonesia or bust, Indonesia until we die. Yeah. And listeners, if you want to know more about NKRI, we actually had a whole episode about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll post links to that so that you can get a little bit more in-depth uh, understanding of what that slogan means. But suffice to say that it promotes a certain unhealthy level of nationalism, in my opinion. I know. And like in Indonesian history, like Indonesian university students in general have been a hotbed for political reforms, political activism. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's that element as well that kind of make people think that because they're West Papuan, they must be West Papuan activists, even though there's mm -hmm. not necessarily a correlation. Um it's just a confluence of factors that really led to this overreaction, in my opinion. Yeah, and especially since, like, we have no idea where what the source of the story is, right? Like, mm -hmm. who first disseminated the story that circulated around WhatsApp? There's a lot of question marks around that. Mm -hmm. uh, regardless, the fact that things could escalate so quickly over the course of a weekend is certainly troubling for anyone who cares about the safety and rights of these people. Yeah. And so, 
uh, with all of this news and tension happening over the weekend in Surabaya, things escalated even more on Sunday and going into Monday when huge protests uh, started to happen in the West Papuan capital of Manokwari, as well as Jayapura, where hundreds of people uh, marched and demonstrated against the arrest of these students. And in Manokwari in particular, protesters set fire to the local parliament building because they wanted to hold the authorities accountable. You know, they burned tires through tree branches and everything. And there was a lot of a lot of damage. And the police and the military all had to come in to help quell the masses uh, over the weekend. Yeah. In addition to all these protests, you know, representatives from Papua, you know, the Papua governor, Lucas Nembe, have told police that the Papuans were angry because of, quote, extremely racist words by East Java people, the police and the military. You know, uh, we mentioned earlier that there were people who were calling the West Papuan students, you know, monkey chants, uh, you know, saying really horrible racial slurs. So all of these tensions started to escalate and it became a huge clash. And we're still obviously, you know, this just happened over the last 24 hours. We're still not sure how things are going to die down and what's going to happen next. I think all of this cannot be taken into isolation with kind of the history of all of the things that happened leading up to this and like kind of why there's so much tension between West Papuans and Japanese Indonesian government. I don't know. Um, I mean, that's really the heart of this episode, you know, what we're going to dig into the history of this tension and why we've arrived at this place where people are yelling racial slurs at, at a group of students. Uh, for what is probably a hoax story. Yeah. So where do we first begin? As we often do with these situations, we first begin with the Dutch. Colonialism! (laughs) Way back when. The root of many historical and continued problems in not just Indonesia, but the world. So, the Dutch. As is often the case, um, obviously, pre-independence, the Dutch controlled a lot of Indonesia, Mm -hmm. and one of which is the territory called the Netherlands New Guinea, which is what is modern-day West Papua. And this was, as it is today, an incredibly resource-rich and fertile region. Like, anybody who wants to take control wants to have West Papua as part of their country. I mean, you know, the same thing for the Dutch, the same thing it is for the Indonesian government right now. Mm -hmm. So, part of the tension that first began following independence is that the Dutch does not want to give up New Guinea to the new Indonesian government. Are we surprised? No. <laughs> no, of course not. And and I think it's also interesting because like pretty much Indonesia's entire kind of geographical lines in general has it's all sort of like, okay, what was previously Dutch colonized in this area? We're all gonna just take it and call it Indonesia mm-hmm. because it's not like Indonesia as a country as a concept You know, we're spread over so many islands, over so many different ethnicities. So it's sort of like, okay, let's just take all of this and like make it into a country, right? Mm -hmm. The founding fathers kind of created a national identity and like the idea that Indonesia now exists as its own country with its own identity is like a big part of success in terms of Indonesia's history. Um, Like there are different countries where this clearly one country with one general ethnicity but Indonesia is not one of them. No. And I think that has always been part of... Attention. The part of attention. And also, I think the founding fathers were very clear about what is at the heart of the Indonesian project, right? The project of the Republic of Indonesia. This whole idea of from Sabang to Marauke, mm-hmm. you know, from the very edge of Sumatra to the very edge of Papua. Mm-hmm. That is Indonesia. But the truth is, before independence, uh, before the Dutch, those were all different... <laughs> Tribes, ethnicities, communities, even kingdoms. Kingdoms. So. Yeah. Uh, With different religions. Yeah, different languages, different backgrounds. You know, it's it's highly, in my opinion, it's highly contentious, you know, what exactly makes up Indonesia. Mm-hmm. And so the founding fathers, you know, in an effort to create a new nation, 
yeah. um, made up the made up the framework, right? And that framework, they were gung ho about including West Papua. So in 1952, when this happened, the Dutch considered this issue to be closed, but Sukarno was just like, hell no, Mm -hmm. um, and adopted a more forceful stance. And at this point, Indonesian domestic politics, this became a really hot topic that kind of united all of the political parties across Mm -hmm. Indonesia's political spectrum. And they all supported Sukarno's effort. And in this time, uh, Indonesia decided to take this matter into the United Nations. And then, like, in 1955, in the Bandung Conference, Indonesia su- succeeded in securing the support from other Afro-Asian countries, um, and including the Soviet Union. And on the other side, right, the Netherlands had support for their claim over New Guinea from the U.S., the U.K., Australia, New Zealand, a lot of European countries and Latin American countries, too. So... There was clearly a global divide along not only, I would say, ethnic lines, but also... Mostly racial lines. But also political. And sphere of influence line, yeah. And also political right. lines, right? These are sort of like the, the traditional colonizers and then the decolonized countries plus yeah. Soviet Union. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, that tension over this piece of land, it became a worldwide tension that also played into the fears of the Cold War. But like, right. is the communist bloc going to um, gain some sort of greater power if Indonesia gains this territory? Or is the Netherlands' claim of the New Guinea will help protect you know, the Western allies against the communist bloc? So there's a lot of political uh, tensions around this that is beyond just like the claim of land. Right. It's totally along racial mm-hmm. lines as well as like power blocks with in 1955 world. But one crucial point is that while the US, UK, and Australia supported the Netherlands, they were unwilling to commit to providing military support in the event of a conflict. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, yeah, you deserve this. But, you know, you're on your own. And actually, this is going to be a crucial point later on in history. Yeah. Uh, as we fast forward a couple more years, mm-hmm. in 1959, Indonesia adopted a policy of confrontation against the Dutch, in which they adopted a much more aggressive and, you know, as the name suggests, confrontational approach to negotiating with the Dutch. And at the heart of this is the uh, the territorial claims over uh, West Papua. Mm-hmm. So during this time, the Indonesian government targeted Dutch interests. You know, uh, the Dutch carrier KLM no longer had landing rights over Indonesia. A lot of Dutch-owned businesses, including banks and estates, were seized by the government. And a lot of Dutch nationals left the country because of this. Yeah, tens of thousands of them. Mm-hmm. You know what's interesting, though, that I, you know, as we discovered in our research, I did not realize that as part of uh, the Dutch approach towards this increasing confrontation, they actually helped foster the sense of West Papuan national identity uh-huh. amongst the Papuans, you know, creating a national flag, the the Morning Star flag, which if you follow Papuan news, especially the independence movement, you'll you'll notice that flag. Yeah. And the national anthem and everything like that, you know, really supporting claims of Papua to, to have its own sovereignty. Yeah. Qu- but quote unquote under Dutch guidance. Whatever. Right. Whatever that means. <laughs> I mean like I think this is kind of the policy of like, okay, if we can't have you Indonesia can't have you. You're going to be your own country now, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it should be met kind of with some skepticism. Yeah. I mean, both sides were having, you know, both sides were employing their tactics, right? Diplomacy and military tactics to lay claim over this area. Yeah. Um, Eventually, in 1961, there's a full-scale military invasion codenamed Operation Tricora. And guess who's leading this invasion? (laughs) Our next dictator, Suharto. He keeps popping up now that we're doing this like deep dives back into history. Okay, semi deep dives into history. It's like, wait, what? This guy again? Like, yeah, um, he was he was the major so, general that was leading this yeah. operation, and it's, so it's kind of like unfair when people are saying like, oh, like he wasn't really known before this time. No, he was known. He did some stuff. The government knew him. <laughs> yeah. So during this whole time, as the tension between Indonesia and the Dutch escalated, the other player in the future of West Papua was the U.S. And this was during the Kennedy administration. And they were worried 
about the growing influence of the communist bloc, as one does during that time if you're the American president. Ah, uh, yes, so, Kennedy. Uh, the Kennedy administration went on a massive effort to try to help negotiate some sort of ceasefire, some sort of peace between the Dutch yeah. and the Indonesian so that this doesn't somehow aid uh, the communist bloc and the Soviet Union, and etc. And so this is what led to the historic New York Agreement in 1962. Yeah. The representatives from both the Dutch and the Indonesians sat together and agreed on a game plan for the future of West Papua. The most important part about the New York Agreement is it finally gave West Papua territory to Indonesia. But. But under the following parameters, which will become historically controversial. Yeah. And that is the parameters for the Act of Free Choice, which basically dictates that consultative councils in West Papua would be instructed on procedures, electoral procedures, to access the will of the population to determine sovereignty. Right. Yeah. This act basically says that there needs to be a vote. There needs to be a democratic vote that would allow the inhabitants to decide whether they want to be part of Indonesia or not. Mm -hmm. And all adults would be allowed to participate in this act of free choice. This was baked into the agreement. Uh, both parties signed it. It was a huge part of basically both parties agreeing that West Papua or West New Guinea at this time will become part of Indonesia. So the act of free choice. Stephanie, is it really an act of free choice? <laughs> nope. Big fat nope. So fast forward, right? This is 1962, New York Agreement. Both, part, both governments have agreed to this, and they said they will put into plans uh, for this act of free choice to happen with the UN observing it, right? Because it's an international thing. People signed it and everything. Yeah. In 1969, an election was held in August 2nd, uh, the act of free choice, or Penentuan Pendapat Rakyat, in which about a thousand or so men and women uh, were selected by the Indonesian military to vote on this matter. And guess what? They all voted publicly and unanimously in favor for of Indonesian control. If, listeners, you remember, the New York Agreement said that all men and women who were not foreign nationals, who were Papuans, had the right to vote. But on that day in August 2nd, a thousand or so men and women were selected by the Indonesian military. And supposedly there were guns involved too, mm -hmm. and they were like sat down in front of everybody and asked to vote by raising their hands. Yeah. So it's not even like they're voting in a ballot. Mm -hmm. No. They are like literally voting in front of military men with guns. As well as UN observers. Which is kind of like... Astounding, right? Like, what were the UN observers doing at this point? Like, you were, you have one job. Mm -hmm. You have one job. Yeah. A thousand or so men and women voted on behalf of an estimated population of 800,000. Yeah. So the journalist from Rogers, Hugh Loon, said um, the men who were selected to vote were blackmailed into voting against independence for threats of violence against their person and their families. And released diplomatic cables to American diplomats suspecting that Indonesia could not have won a fair vote. But the diplomats saw the event as a foregone conclusion and marginal to U.S. interests. So nothing further to be done there. And so this quote-unquote act of free choice basically has become the historic argument used by the Indonesian government to this day that West Papua should be part of Indonesia. Yeah. And over the course of the next 40, 50 years, Various groups, both uh, nationally in Indonesia as well as internationally, have appealed to the UN, have appealed to international authorities yeah. that this is not a real act of free choice. This is right. a false referendum and demanded a new referendum to really... I mean, also, if we were going to cover the next 40 years of Papuan activism... We do not have enough time. I don't. We don't have enough, <laughs> have enough time. And I think we should probably interview someone who knows this better than we do. Just but scratching the surface, there's two factions right now that are most active. It's the OPM, or Free Papua Movement, and the United Liberation Movement for West Papua, ULMWP. And mm -hmm. these are kind of like two big organizations kind of with like differing tactics and differing leaderships, even though like some leaders have moved within 
and there are some questionable tactics involved with relating to murders and use of child soldiers, uh, teenage soldiers. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, like a lot of the leaders of these movements have also been exiled to the Netherlands or anywhere else, basically, uh, where they can find asylum status because it's not like they have the freedom to advocate for what they believe in. Mm -hmm. And I mean... From this point on, like, Indonesia in general has had a really bad track record of really treating Papua as a province with dignity and full rights and access to, you know, healthcare, education, and resources. It's like we kind of have an extractionary relationship. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of military presence in this area, and a lot of times, like, this area has been like kind of a testing ground for Indonesian army operations and like kind of where soldiers are supposed to prove their mettle. Mm -hmm. um, so it's both a failure in bureaucracy, administration and military violence. Yeah. We've talked a lot about the history and the politics of this, but you know, a lot of academics have also argued that West Papuans as an ethnic group are very different from the rest of Indonesia. If we were to just I mean but compare but like it's not radically that different from Maluku. I mean it was different. But that's part of the thing. Like right? if we're gonna like, talk about difference, it's kind of like that's not the point. The point is like the relationship and the history that relates to it and the fact that we haven't improved the living conditions in an equitable way, too. Mm. You know? Like, because I think in general, like, Indonesia doesn't really have a claim towards difference because every part of the country is different. Mm -hmm. The point is, like, where has the resources been distributed and what True. rights haven't been granted. And whether or not it's equitable if yeah. it's supposedly a democracy. And I don't know what to think about, you know, where things should go. I just think that the way things are is not good. <laughs> and Not fair. Not fair. And that's even in Jokowi's administration, right? A lot of people have always said that Jokowi has, has been better for Indonesia. But on this, on this particular matter, he's just continued the same, the same approach. Right. And I feel like he's made a big show of trying to improve it compared to previous presidents. Like, he started a lot of big infrastructure projects in Papua, building roads and building ports, um, things like that. But, you know, is it too little too late? Mm -hmm. And um, is this what he's saying regarding this, the activities of the past weekend also, like, not the best thing to say after this happened? Because of this conflict, he said, my brothers and sisters... Uh, in West Papua, I know all of you feel offended, and this is why I urge all, all of us as fellow countrymen to forgive each other. And he said that forgiveness and patience were better responses to the present situation. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of just like, if you really understood what people meant, like, I think, like, it would have been better to say, like, we messed up, our, my police department did something that was mm -hmm. wrong for which we will investigate and for which we need to examine our country's racial tensions and past for us to be able to move forward and how we can do this. Like, I'm open to hear how you would want this to be resolved, you know, instead of like telling those who are just who have had a history of repression to like have more patience and to forgive. And it also doesn't invalidate the racial slurs, yeah, yeah, and and the hatred that some people were throwing at the West Papuans, right? Like, even if you were taking a very, you know, conservative diplomatic stance on this, you should still, mm -hmm. in my opinion, denounce the racism that was, yeah, that helped build the tensions here, right? Right, regardless of uh, what you want to say about the the conflict, the violence, but there was clear, like, racism played a part in how things escalated. And it doesn't, you know, how can we just forgive racism if you're not going to address it? Yeah. But I think, like, in a way, it's also, like, I feel like I don't have the right to say what is to be done or what is going to be done about the situation. I am not West Papuan, and I don't want to presume 
that I can make an opinion about this decision, and I feel like it should be in their democratic choice to、True. decide what they want to be done in the country. As an Indonesian, however, I think in the meantime it is on the Indonesian people and Indonesian government to truly question what we've done and、mm-hmm. try as immediately as possible to rectify the situation practically, but also as an Indonesian, like. Examine the prejudices that we have against、yeah. West Papuans and like confront their racism within our communities.、Mm-hmm. And one thing that for sure I think is maybe more applicable to our audience is that I think there's a lot of cultural appropriation that middle upper class Indonesians have in terms of West Papuan culture and wear that I don't feel comfortable with.、Mm-hmm. Like Agnes Monica, Indonesian pop star, just like using West Papuan. Culture attributes people to decorate themselves and decorate their photo shoots or whatever,、mm-hmm. and that's really and to messed claim up. Claim that identity, yeah, to claim that identity and like use that in the international stage. And I'm like, that's not ours. That is not our culture. And especially claiming to a Western audience that this is yours because you're Indonesian is somewhat disingenuous to me、mm-hmm. because you know you're expecting they don't know. And like, unless you you wear that with the acknowledgement that okay, this is a part of a larger historical thing of which they did not have an active free choice to be a part of our country, and use that as an awareness thing. I don't feel comfortable with that being used. You know,、mm-hmm. as you as you mentioned, Steph,、um, I think a lot of us can also work on confronting our own prejudices and our own preconceived notions about West Papuans and their culture and their. Their role in society, right? Because there are stereotypes that like some people have about West Papuans,、mm-hmm. and that's not okay. And you know, we have to confront our friends if they're saying things that are not okay about it. You know,、mm-hmm. we should take the time to maybe educate our friends about what really happened, because this this stuff is sure as hell not being taught in in our history textbooks, and it's certainly not being distributed in any pop culture or sort of like mainstream. Avenues of information, yeah. And at the heart of this whole tension, this buildup was hoaxes and misinformation that fed、yeah. into these racial tensions. And so, and like you know, our is our Indonesian patriotism toxic, right? Like, do we have that? And that's also a part of the whole thing that we need to look at.、Mm-hmm. So a disclaimer about this episode: we are not Papuan, nor are we experts of West Papuan and Indonesian history. We have compiled this podcast, and what we're saying is as rigorously back on journalism and history as we can. And obviously, it is powered by our flimsy but earnest logic, but it is still flimsy and it is still earnest. So take it with a grain of salt, perhaps. More than your usual cups of salt. Yeah, cups of salt.、Uh, but at the same time, we also feel that we should talk about this, even with our limited knowledge, our limited background. Yeah, listeners, we'll we'll post links and we'll post our resources in our show page, and we encourage you to read up more about this because there's obviously so much more than what we talked about in this episode. And as this news continues to break, there's going to be more conversations, and we encourage you to educate yourself as much as we have. In this matter.、Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can find more information and resources of whatever we talked about on our website, dialica.id. Music credits to John Dealey, Lee Rosevere, and of course, Broke for Free. If you like what you hear and want to support us, please review our podcast on the Apple Podcast app or whatever app you use to listen to your podcast. And please share our podcast with your friends. It's the best way to spread the word about Dialogica. If you want to get more involved, we'd love to hear from you. Our email is dialogicapodcast@gmail.com, or just shoot us a message on our Facebook page. You can also find us on Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, and on Twitter. Please follow us in these various platforms. Our Twitter handle is at dialogicapod. Also, follow me on Twitter. It's Steph Tank. 
That's S-T-E-P-H-T-A-N-G-K. Thank you again and see you guys next time. Bye.